I guess the quiet is my cue. Good evening, I'm David Nixon. I'm the Artistic Director of Northern Valley, and I'd like to welcome you to Behind the Veil. Um, it's great seeing familiar faces and uh, sponsors, and I think hopefully some new faces to Northern Valley. I'm particularly thrilled that Keith Howard is sitting there in the audience, a great support of the company, and also Graham, and I think some others from First Direct who have just become a fantastic support to this company, and um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that at the end of our program. Um, what shall I say? I'd also like to welcome, I, I forgot the whole thing, but the live stream. I'd like to welcome anybody who is watching us on our live stream. That's a fantastic new thing that we have in this world today. Um, when I was dancing, I couldn't even watch ballet really on TV in those days. You really had to go to the theater to see it. So we've moved on immensely, and we can do an event like tonight. So how did we get to here? Uh, when we were planning our rep a few years ago um, in our Arts Council funding application, uh, one of the things that I wanted to do was something about um, remarkable women. And um, to tell you a little thing about me, I'm a big fan of British history, but especially the royal family. My father was a history teacher, and most summers we came from Canada and we spent them in England, and my dad would take me all around. Tower of London, go to York, um, all the Hampton Court, all these things. And I became quite obsessed with it, so much so that when I was about eight, nine, I started going around all the China stores that used to exist selling commemorative China. And I actually have been sorting through a hundred piece collection of commemorative China that dates back to Victoria's wedding up to present day. So, of course, when I was thinking of women and English women and British women, I thought immediately of Elizabeth I. Victoria, and Elizabeth II. I think they're all remarkable women in their own way, and also fascinating at the same time. Um, they have personalities that are very interesting. It seemed to me that we couldn't do really all three of them, so I settled on Victoria, and immediately came to mind Kathy Marston. Uh, Kathy has had a long-term um, relationship with us, and I felt that the best person to create a ballet about a woman is a woman. And also Kathy is, I think, really at her peak right now as a creator. Uh, she's most recently done Jane Eyre for us, which has been a fantastic success, not only for us, but for Kathy. And it's going to be performed by American Ballet Theater in the spring, by the Joffrey Ballet in the autumn. And um, this has also led to her now choreographing for San Francisco Ballet, and uh, she's just had a premiere recently, in, uh, Le Grand Ballet de Canadienne, and I, th I think she's on the most wanted choreographer list right now. In fact, I told her the other day, I don't think you have anything to prove. I think you've seriously accomplished that. So, Kathy said, yes. Oh, can I fit it in? I was like, oh God, if she can't fit it in, what are we going to do? Because I think she's perfect for this. Because Kathy will bring to it something that no one else does. Um, it's, she has a specific way of working, and she has this incredible intelligence and mind that grasps a story from a different direction than you expect. And that is always what we're interested in in the theater, is that we come to see something slightly different than what we wanted to see, perhaps, because we're surprised. So I'm now going to be quiet, and I'm going to turn this over to someone very interesting. So, Kathy, please. Oh, I don't need a microphone. <laughs> Hello. So I should explain a little bit. David said I often take things from uh, slightly unusual angles. And with Victoria, this was a huge challenge because I keep using this expression. She essentially, her life takes up about 100 years of world history, more or less, and there's many different perspectives from which you can view it. And lots have been done. There's numerous TV programs and biographies and films. Um, and not that I felt that we had to take a different or a new original angle, um, but I felt that we needed to take a perspective that didn't say we know who Victoria was, because I don't think she's that sort of lady. You don't know who she was. She was so many different things to different people. Um, so I invited Uzma Hamid, who's going to join us in a little bit, to be part of the project with me as a dramaturg and to write the scenario with me. And we spent a couple of months um, more or less independently researching. 
we read sort of wedge book, wedge sized books, um, some biographies of Victoria that led to books on the different parts of the empire and Victoria as a mother, Victoria as a queen, all different angles. And over this time, we emailed to each other little, any little snippets that we found interesting. And then Uzma joined me. Uh, I live in Switzerland. I live in Bern with my family. And she joined me in Bern for a week. And we filled my living room with post-its. Um, so we decided we'd write on a post-it anything that, we, that had struck us, that we found intriguing. It might be a visual image, or it might be a relationship, or it might be a character, or any of those things. Um, and slowly patterns began to emerge. So you sort of saw Victoria as mother, or Victoria um, and addiction. I don't know why I'm saying that first. Or Victoria and passion. And various strands popped out. Um, for example, now I've mentioned passion and addiction, the color red kept coming up. Um, and I found this really intriguing, because I love trying to uh, distill ideas to quite simple images, because that's what we have to do on stage. Um, and the color red seemed to symbolize a lot of these things. So addiction poppies, you know, there was this whole opium war, and Lord M, who was one of the characters in her, uh, the early part of her reign, um, was apparently a little high on opium during her coronation. Um, passion, we hear of uh, Victoria that her relationship with Albert was both passionate physically and also very fiery in terms of her temperament. Um, there were also things like the red carpet, the coronation, we think of red as a sort of very royal color. And then I came across uh, the image of her diaries, and she wrote thousands, or not thousands, but hundreds, a lot. She wrote every day hundreds of words, letters to friends and acquaintances and family, but also her personal journal. And apparently, these journals were red. And I thought, wow, that's... I, I, so red became a big post-it. <laughs> um, on the other side, we came across this little nugget of a story that no one really knows if it was true or not. Um, it's a sort of myth, I guess. And it was about the night in which, on which Albert died. Um, so obviously, Albert was the love of her life. They met very young, and they actually didn't fall in love straight away. But when they did fall in love, she proposed after five days, I think. And big relationship, very passionate. A lot of stuff happened. But then he died um, very early on. And it was absolutely heartbreaking, devastating to her. And we, we know, of course, the image of Victoria as the widow forever after, that sort of figure in black. Um, and apparently on the night that Albert died, she, she'd had nine children, by the way, in case you didn't know that. Um, the, she ran to the bedroom of the youngest child, Beatrice, who was then aged four, and gathered Beatrice in her arms and wrapped her in Albert's dressing gown, which, by the way, was dark red, and took her to bed and kind of never let go. Um, obviously, that's sort of metaphorical. But Beatrice then became her companion throughout her whole life. And while all the other children were sent off into these more or less arranged marriages around Europe and really created the royal dynasty that we know about, um, Beatrice was very much kept at her mother's side. And you know, my instinct was, gosh, that must have been awful. <laughs> the more I get to know about Beatrice, I don't know. There was a very special love and loyalty that developed between these two women. Um, and it's been a really interesting pro process working with the dancers to find out what that relationship was. Um, and was it like, uh, was, did Beatrice want to rebel and go and have a life elsewhere like her siblings? Or actually, was she happy and fulfilled being her mother's, um, I don't want to say shadow because that's wrong. Her com companion is probably the best word. In some ways, she was an echo of her mother. The, the echo thing is enhanced because at one point, literally behind her mother's back at a, a wedding, a family wedding, Beatrice managed to meet a man. Um, now, until this point, Victoria had um, told, you know, she, no one was allowed to talk about husbands, romance, anything like that in front of Beatrice. Um, but on, on the day of a wedding, Victoria, uh, sorry, Beatrice managed to meet Lico. I'm just pointing over here because Sam over here is being Beatrice, old Beatrice, and Mickey is being young Beatrice, and Sean is being Lico. So I want to do this introduction before we start the rehearsal. So they, they meet and they fall in love, and um, Victoria is furious, <laughs> absolutely furious, and bans the wedding, and Beatrice, even though she's terribly shy, um, sort of holds her ground, which is quite out of character, for seven months. 
She lives with her mother, hardly speaking to one another. And finally, P Victoria is persuaded to come round and allow them to marry on the condition that they live uh, with her in her palace, um, which wasn't very, oh, it lasted for 10 years and they had four children, but unfortunately, you know, Liko was this athletic, um, you know, ex-soldier or military man, and it was very frustrating to him to be sort of caught up in this very domestic royal household. So after 10 years, he rebelled and went off back to, to join the military and unfortunately got killed even on the boat going to the war that he was going to. So Beatrice became literally her mother's echo in that she was also a widow even longer than Victoria. Um, I should jump to the end of Victoria's life here. So on just before she died, we think, um, Victoria entrusted Beatrice with uh, all of her written work. So it's a little unclear as to exactly what the instruction was, but Beatrice certainly understood that she should take care of all of the diaries that Victoria had written and make sure they were fit for publication. Victoria was very conscious of her image um, and what she would leave behind, her story, I guess. She was a storyteller herself. Um, and so Beatrice, over the 30 years after her mother died, rewrote all of the diaries, how many, 111? 122 would reduce to 111. So she wrote the whole thing, and you'll notice there's a difference there. The reason that there were less in the end was because she edited them. And this is quite controversial historically, um, because she didn't write down every word that Victoria wrote. She took some bits out, and she rephrased. And so what we think we have of Victoria's sort of first-hand evidence is actually not from Victoria. It's Victoria through the eyes of her daughter. And I found this an incredibly interesting perspective from which to view this remarkable woman that David had invited me to choreograph. So the whole ballet, even though it's called Victoria, is actually told from the point of view of Beatrice. And we experience li Victoria's life through her eyes as she takes on this enormous task of rewriting it. Um, I know we'll talk about this later, so I'm not going to talk too much now, but I wanted to give you that introduction because the first bit that we're going to work on tonight is actually not with Victoria. <laughs> it's probably one of about eight minutes in the entire piece that Victoria is not on stage. Um, and it's a trio. So we have Sam or Pippa, sorry. <laughs> I know this brilliant dancer since a very long time. And she was called Sam when we knew her the first time. <laughs> Um, so it's Pippa, and she, well, she's, it's the fourth time, isn't it, that we've collaborated. The fourth ballet that I've made for Northern Ballet, and Pippa's been in every one. And it's, and it's uh, am I allowed to say that? Yeah. It's her last one. Um, and I'm so honoured that, that she's going to be the sort of the guide through my last ballet. She's an incredible artist. Um, so she's old Beatrice. When I say old, she's actually supposed to be the same age as me, and I have to share <laughs> this little anecdote. Um, we're more or less the same age. Are we allowed to say age? Yeah. How old are you? She's 44. And, you know, because she's, <laughs> she's only small. No, but it's lovely to play a woman. I know. Woman. You say it, because you said yeah, it's I so just funny. Said to Kathy, I said it's wonderful to play a woman my own age. I'm not pretending to be 21 or 11 she's or 80. <laughs> Beatrice was 44 when her mother died, and that's how the ballet starts. So she's finally, uh, uh, you said on the I first day, after a career of being children and grandmothers, <laughs> she's playing her own age. Mickey, on the other, well, how old are you? 22. So she's not that far. So <laughs> Mickey, Mickey is being Sam's younger self. So, Sa sorry, Pippa, I'm yes. sorry. Um, so Pippa is looking back and rewriting the diaries and remembering the experiences uh, that she shared with her mother and the various characters around. And... Mickey is the Beatrice that's living them, so sort of sits in Pippa's imagination, if you understand what I mean. So we're going to work on this moment. It's, it's, the, bit, it's the happy moment um, in the ballet where they've finally been allowed to get married. Sean is being Lico, and they've, they've gotten married, and Victoria has just left the room <laughs> for four minutes, and <laughs> there's this duet, and it was supposed to be a duet of happiness, and then I felt like I wanted old Beatrice to really be, if there was any moment that she would sort of completely be consumed by and want to relive, I felt that it was this moment. So I said, okay, we're going to make this a trio. 
And the rule is, and you can tell us if you see us breaking it tonight, they are not allowed to see her and there are no lifts, so it's really quite um, intricate and involved, but there aren't any lifts. So many lifts you would use a grab, and we're not going to let that happen because he can't grab her because she's not there. Do you understand what I mean? I can grab him. He, she can grab him because it's her memory. She can do what she wants. <laughs> so she can do, like any partnering needs to sort of exist in kind of weight-bearing or slides or these kind of things, but you can't actually really do that. And if you see it happen, you can lift up your hands <laughs> and give the correction. I think I've talked enough. I was only supposed to talk five minutes, so let's start. <laughs> Should we go? So we're really rehearsing now. We're, this, we've, we've, made, we've made this trio, but we haven't really rehearsed it, so this is, like, real. <laughs> this is actually happening. Okay. And, oh, I didn't introduce Christelle. Christelle is the wonderful rehearsal director of Northern Ballet, and I begged her to join us, because she's much better than I am at technical things. <laughs> so she might help tonight. Okay, should we go from the beginning? So you go through it, and I'm just going to point out a few things as we're going. Okay, I'm already going to point things out. So this is a bit of a mo motif of Beatrice. She was known as the shy princess, so she kind of just stands a bit like this quite often. But Sean is slowly unravelling her. And Sean liked to go bike riding, didn't you? He, he was given a bicycle, because of course bicycles were a thing of the Victorian era. So, let's go again. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt you all the time. And so, I really, really want to see that. How I keep meaning to say that. Let's look at how we can definitely get that visible. You know what, Sam? I think it's. D can you not anticipate it? So let us see that. There you go. How can you coordinate that releve, Nikki? Just go back to that releve. So when it, it feels like you're in a position, then you just pop up. Yeah. Is there a possibility to bring that together? Um, yeah, oh, almost. <laughs> There you go, and keep going from there, and down, and now you're going to bump it into that. Is this, this, have we actually ever spaced this? No, should we pretend, that, can I go here and I'll not make a funny noise? Is this okay? Yeah, let's take it all a bit for, further forward then. Okay, so let's go from, you've done, you've done the releve, you've done the attitude, and see if you can get those um, chetés coming backwards. So one, two, three. Is it possible to travel them anymore? I don't know how much. You only do one set per jeté, don't you? Should we try two? It would, I think it might feel more like more flight with that. And one da da two da da da. Okay, let's try again. Mickey, are you able to lie back in it anymore? Yeah. Yeah, that's nicer. Ooh, I'm gone. One. Okay, what I like about that step is less the big split and more the the envelope. So let's see. The the transition between the last jeté and the lift. Can we check that out? So one. And now, okay. Um you almost need to turn out less. Because if you go like that and you're super tender, I don't see the knee. So you kind of need to show me the knee coming down there. Yep. And ooh, yes, that's beautiful. That was really good. And there. Oh, okay. Is that safe? Yes, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Can you just confirm to the audience <laughs> that was safe? Okay. Uh, let's do it one more time. So you've done the envelope, you're sliding in. And, well, yeah, you're fine. Um, okay, keep going. You've got this now, haven't you? 
me, almost. So what's the cue for you to get off his leg? Because you put your head on his leg, don't you? No, and no roots stay suspended. But is there, what's the reason, Pete? Was there not a, was there any reason? Hmm. Feels like there would want to be something. So Mickey, because I'd like to have the sort of photo moment where Mickey's back and let this arm fly a little yeah, bit back. Yeah, little I think so, so I can get that image, yeah. So Mickey, go back onto his leg if you can. There, where are you going to be in that? So you don't look at her, look at her. Yeah, that's it. That's the image. Ah, well, that's a sort of beautiful thing. So if she's there, and you have to be really careful not to look at Sam, so it was lovely when you come right round. And if as Mickey's hand is coming, that would be a good reason for you to locate the leg. <laughs> yeah. And then, right, let's carry on from there. Good. And relax, and relax. Uh, stop. Um, come back up. Is there... I feel like you should want to know what was out there as well. So he's, he's saying to you, look, we could go and move to the Isle of Wight, which they did, let's imagine. Um, yeah, can you? <laughs> oh. And one. All right. Yeah. A bit tricky, isn't it? It's a bit, it was a bit um, mm -hmm. stilted. Yeah. Are you able to go, if you really went... Where, where am I? You're like this. You're coming through my leg. If you, if you, ah, oh, just because you've got one leg up, that's a problem. Let me try it with one leg. One more time. There. Um, I see that leg feels easier than that leg. Are you on the cross leg? I was on the open. Try it again and see. Uh, no, the open leg felt better. See if you can do that. Yeah, beautiful, that's nice. And keep going from there yeah. quite quickly. <laughs> <laughs> and there you go. Good. This always feels a bit too cunning in class. So it is a triplet, but you kind of need, need to run it. Yeah. yeah. Da 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 da. Yum, bum, bum, ba, ya da, ya da, 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 da. One, beautiful. Good. So, Mickey, just be clear about your footwork. What are you doing from the here? <coughs> Two, three, one, two, three, one. One more time. So the, the in between bit, right side leg first. One, two, three, one, two, three. And what's making you turn <laughs> by yourself? That's the thing, isn't it? So you're, you're nervous about this thing. One, two, three, one, two, three. I will go if you'll hold me. Yeah? <laughs> Make that a thing with her. Yeah, should we try it from the triplet? <laughs> look at her. Oh, when do you want the moment? Oh, but you didn't look at her. Were you, did you mean a moment of looking at Mickey? No. no she ah. didn't just she in the timing. Just timing. Mm. Sometimes she comes could, could you have looked at her? Like. <laughs> 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 This is a really hard thing for him because he's sort of like doing that all the time. Which I think. There, that's it. And then she's coming. Yes, good. And then keep going from there. Yeah, so baby steps. Apparently, I read in a biography, I can't remember which one, this one might remember, that Lico coaxed, um, coaxed Beatrice out of her sort of shell in baby steps, which I really liked because Victoria and Albert and everybody called Beatrice baby forever. She was a sort of a baby for life. So I liked this. We've got a motif. Do you want to show the motif? This sort of sense of like baby steps. She's going into this other world of marriage, of adulthood, but only through little steps. And this is the same thing, isn't it? So you've got to don't make it too confident. It's really inshallah, inshallah, inshallah. Yeah. And yeah. You can let you can say, okay, so it's quite fast in reality, isn't it? This, yeah, okay. But I was going to say you could make that, but it's fast enough. Yeah, okay, and again. And yeah, da, 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 yeah, da, 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 da. One more. And a wee, I like that. Good. Is that a funny moment? After you, a little bit for you, you have a, uh, just, just check it.
Do you need to? Okay, try it once more with the the two of you. And go la da 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 yum. You do you, what are you trying to land on? Two feet? Because I I just see a little shuffle at the back. Tombe. Okay. And again. Tombe. That's better. Oh. Well, it was better for her, and then it wasn't you. Any thoughts? Okay. Yeah. Good. That is better. Yes. Good. Okay. And again. So I really want to. This is a little motif as well, which I just. I, they did it one day. It, to me, it's like a little bird. You know, a, you don't catch a bird like that. You bring, you put something on your hand, and she comes, and he protects her. Could you lift your elbow a little bit? Yeah. So she's just there. That's lovely. But I want to see the preparation of it, which would mean, what's it, how do you get into it? Like. Could you just do something with your head that, so I see that motion. Yeah. Right, to the ones together. Mm. <laughs> it feels like there's more potential. You're doing this. And are you stepping on this leg? Yeah. And what are you holding on to at this moment? Have you got... What, uh, show me the grip, because I feel like we could just take longer in that turn. There, and stop there. So he's got you. Yeah, he's got you under the pit there. So just if you can steady her on the pit, then she can do a nice head before you turn around. Okay, and let's keep going from there. And go one. There. Push down, push down, push down. <gasps> okay, I didn't quite get enough joy out of that corner there. <sighs> yeah, you've, just, you've got to push down. So, uh, once more, just that little moment. And push, joy, 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 joy. Ah, almost. And again. <laughs> Is it hard with that music? Is it easier? With it? It's really nice music. Okay, they're telling me I've got five. Should we just give it a go? It was a good cue. You said you wanted music. Should we just try it? Okay, we're going to try it. So I should say that the music is by Philip Feeney, um, who many of you here, I'm sure, know because he's um, composed a lot of pieces for Northern Ballet and also with me, including Jane Eyre for Northern Ballet, but other pieces like the suit for Ballet Black that is um, that came here actually to this stage, I think, but it's going to be at various theatres soon. Um, and what else? We've done lots of pieces together and they're all gone out of my head right now, but he's a wonderful composer. And this is the first time that he and I have worked together on, a, on an entirely original score. So with Jane Eyre, there was music by Fanny and Felix Mendelssohn and Schubert together with original Feeney. But this is all Feeney and it's very beautiful. And I'll leave it at that. Okay, it's a rehearsal, it's not a show. I said I'd say that. If it goes wrong, it's fine.
good. <laughs> Told you it was a rehearsal. Yes, it was. It's very complicated for Sean because he's got these two women dangling <laughs> off him. <laughs> no, do you want to fix that one quickly? Do you know what happened? Yeah. This is going. And go in. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. And you go under. And now you see each other. But she. Yes, exactly. And then you're going to keep going. Okay. To be continued. Thank you, guys. Well done. Thank you. Good. <laughs> Over to David. Thank you very much for that. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Some beautiful moments there, especially when she just disappears and then comes back into it. <laughs> and I love the moment when she was being lifted around. Yeah. And she felt that we remember the joy. This one. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful, actually. Yeah. Anyways, moving on. Now we come to the Q&A portion of this, and there should be some chairs <coughs> being set up. Am I supposed to set up the chairs? Um, anyways, here they come, magically. Um, we're going to be joined by uh, Professor Rosemary Mitchell who is a professor at Leeds Trinity University of Victoria Studies. I didn't know there was such a thing as just, it is Victorian. I question that. So of uh, Victorian Studies, and you're also the um, deputy director of the Leeds Center for Victorian Studies. So who perfect to do a Q&A on a ballet about Victoria? And uh, she's going to be joined by Uzma, who we're really thrilled to have collaborating with us for the first time up here in Leeds, and of course, Kathy. So if you want to take a seat. We haven't organized an order, have we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's an absolute delight to be here, and thank you so much to the wonderful dancers and to Kathy for the uh, performance we've just seen, rehearsal. Mm -hmm. um, I've got some questions for both of you. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, I suppose to some extent you've already talked about this, Cathy, but I mean, Queen Victoria's reign is very long. So I really wanted to ask, uh, you know, there's a lot of change for her, there's a lot of change for her country. I really wanted to ask, how do you deal with trying to put this all into one performance? Do you want to, I've talked a lot. Do you want <laughs> to give it a go? <laughs> I think um, we were very keen that we don't try to put it all into one performance and that that isn't our role in making a ballet, but that we're trying to find a way in that speaks to us as the people who are making it, but hopefully will also speak to the audience. Um, and thirdly, hopefully, we'll say something that they perhaps don't know that much about. There's quite a lot about Victoria and Albert and the great romance and Latterly, there's been quite a lot about Victoria and her children and her being quite a sort of domineering and overbearing mother. Um, but it was certainly news to us that Beatrice had edited these diaries of Victoria. Mm. And, and once we found that out, it seemed almost a gift because it, we were keen as well to say something about history and, and the writing of history and the fact that in many ways it, it belongs to those who tell it. And of course, this year is the bicentenary of Victoria's birth and it seemed important to, as, as Cathy said, not to give a sense that, oh, Victoria is somebody that we know and we can actually present you something that's clear and defined and really um, absolutely certain that that's, that's what her life was, um, but that it's always nuanced and interpreted and seen through somebody's eyes. And that was quite important to us, to find a way of talking about history um, as well as talking about Victoria herself. Really interesting. Did you experience any particular problems, or do you find it difficult telling a story backward? Because in well, a we sense, explain, like maybe we should explain <laughs> about the structure. So, once we'd established that we wanted to tell Victoria's story through Beatrice's eyes, we decided that logically, if we start on Victoria's deathbed, essentially, we see her give this task to Beatrice, and then she dies. So Beatrice is sort of in this archive, the set is a giant archive of books, 
so it's slightly expressionistic. There's more books than there really were. <laughs> um, but what's the first thing you do? And we felt that the first thing you might do is remember. So not go back to, well, you know, what was the first diary entry necessarily, but what can I remember of my mother? And without having sort of children in the ballet, which we didn't feel we needed to, to necessarily, we, w we go back to, let's say Beatrice is roughly 14, so an early adolescent. Um, and she, of course, remembers her mother with John Brown. You know, that's who the man in her mother's life was at that point. And so we work through Act One, we work through Victoria's, the second part of Victoria's life. Um, and in that half, Beatrice, as I've explained, meets Liko, and Liko, and there's this relationship with Liko, a happy moment, and then they're living with Victoria, he goes off to war, and he gets killed. And suddenly, she becomes the widow, almost a mirror reflection, if you like, of Victoria. And this seemed to be the kind of crux moment in the ballet, where older Beatrice, looking back, suddenly sees herself becoming her mother and reflecting her in this sort of black dress. Um, and has a bit of a crisis, you know, what, how has this happened to me? How have I become that? And who was that all my mother was? was what was she under this black tent that we nickname it in the studio, this huge black dress? Um, and so that then leads us into Act 2 to peel off that dress and see what was she underneath. Um, and then, of course, Beatrice then experiences her mother as she never knew her um, in the first half of Victoria's life. If I could pick that up, I'm particularly interested because a lot of the recent research from you know, kind of a Victorian studies point of view has stressed that, you know, in a sense, Victoria is not the first Victorian. Um, the image we often have her of her of this very prim and kind of you know, proper middle class lady um, you know, is not really very accurate when you're looking at the younger Victoria, who is frankly a teenage tearaway in many ways. Mm -hmm. you know, she likes parties, she likes dress, she likes sex. She doesn't really like babies. She thinks they're frog-like and they're a bit of a hindrance on her, her life with Albert. So I wondered, is, is Beatrice, in a sense, finding, discovering this unexpected mm. young Victoria as and, she And we imagine she's diaries. sort of taming it. So we'll later see, you use the S word, so I will too, the sex <laughs> duet. <laughs> we call it the passion duet. But, um, yeah, we imagine that first night after she's married. And, and Beatrice, <laughs> and, Sam, and Pippa does it brilliantly, is reading about this and quite discreetly but in ever such a dry English way there's that page out we don't <laughs> need to know that. thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's been a lot of recent coverage of Victoria's life and I'm thinking of the film the, the young Victoria right at the other end of her reign um, very moving Judy Dench Victoria and uh, Abdul kind of film as well the TV series which mm. is obviously rolling forward I wondered did you find these an influence and inspiration, or were there other things that were, besides perhaps the diaries, were talking to you kind of visually? There's a lot of, of books. We're mm -hmm. both quite bookish, quite aren't we? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we, um, there's a wonderful book called The Last Princess by Matthew Dennison, and we drew on that quite a lot, which is specifically about Beatrice and her relationship with Victoria. Um, and that gave us such a lot because, you know, we talk about editing these diaries, but in fact, this process took her 35 years. So as well as spending most of her life with Victoria, she then goes on after Victoria's death and, and spends another 35 years devoted to her mother's memory. And we were just talking today about how this process of editing then becomes so much more than just presenting something that's fit for public consumption and actually becomes something that's really transformative for Beatrice herself. And so, yes, it's about the writing of history, and yes, it's about Victoria's PR, and yes, it's about mothers and daughters, but it's also ultimately about how we deal with loss and how we deal with death. And if you approach it with love in the way that Beatrice so kind of unselfishly does throughout her life with Victoria, that it can be something quite transformational in the end. Sounds very moving. It was. <laughs> we, we were choreographing we were. today uh, <laughs> that Beatrice is solo right at the end, and we were all a bit, we were all a bit too wobbly chin. <laughs> um, Albert is the love of her life, and he's also you know, the guide who makes her into the sort of constitutional queen she develops into. Um, you know, he also, to some extent, represses her. Mm -hmm. you know, it has to be said. Um, the end the article says, you know, she loved him, he diminished her. 
um, I wondered about the other men in her life, particularly kind of perhaps John Brown, Disraeli, mm -hmm. some men she loved, some men like Gladstone, uh, well, Liberal Prime Minister, she absolutely hated. Um, <laughs> who else did you put in and what made you choose them? Well, we've got, we've got John Brown and I, I do have a soft spot for John Brown. <laughs> I know he was not, he, yeah, I mean, yeah. there's some negative sides to him, but he's got a really nice duet <laughs> <laughs> in the piece. It, uh, there's, something, there's something about him that just, yeah. He's not trying to make her anything other than what she is, and I really liked that about him. He's letting her be who she is, or well, that's how it turned out in the studio. Um, there's Lord M, and I have a soft <laughs> spot for him as well, Lord Melbourne. Um, I mean, I, that w when David asked me to create the piece, I think he emailed me on a Friday night, would you like to make Victoria? And um, I took the Saturday to binge watch the ITV series, which I hadn't yet. And he emailed me on Saturday and went, well. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd only got up to Lord M, but I already knew that that was, yeah, okay, yes, is the answer. So he's in there. But Disraeli, you mentioned him, he's a fantastic character. And actually, talking of books, um, this book came a little late in the day for our, the main part of our research, but... The, is it the Lucy Wolsey Lucy book? One, yeah. There's a wonderful chapter about tea with Disraeli in it, and just a couple of anecdotes that I love. Apparently, she says um, Disraeli, Victoria was coming for tea, and she cut he cut off the bottom of one of his dining room chairs so she wouldn't, you know, feel uncomfortable because she was rather little. Um, and he placed a sculpture or a statue of John Brown with his famously gorgeous legs in the hallway so that Victoria would sort of see John Brown as he was coming in. And it, I mean, Disraeli's this terribly flamboyant character. And we have, we've got one scene which we did put in, not for any real narrative <coughs> purpose. Other, it's, it's when Disraeli makes her Empress of India, which was important to us, but we probably could have nailed it in the Parliament scene that we've got before. But I just felt this image of almost like a Mad Hatter's tea party, where you've got it's, it's in my, I mean, I don't think this actually happened, but tea with Disraeli, John Brown, Beatrice and Victoria, and it's terribly Alice in Wonderland. And of course, he, Lewis Carroll based uh, the Red Queen, isn't it, on Victoria. And I think Disraeli is a character, I've forgotten which character in Alice in Wonderland yeah. as well. Still the lizard or something. And, like and then um, Beatrice is very Alice, and I think Leopold had a relationship with the real Alice, didn't he? So, so there's this real Alice in Wonderland connection. and. It's just a detail. You're not going to need to know that if you're watching the ballet. But for us, it was really inspiring and as, you know, inspired choreography. Yeah. Absolutely wonderful. Can I ask, um, I mean, obviously you focus very much on Queen Victoria's life. Um, I suppose the defining moment for her is the death of Albert. And I wondered how you managed to convey her almost pathological grief in the face of the you know, loss of the... I haven't done that bit yet. That's, that's Monday's task. Ah, <laughs> it'll be very <laughs> interesting. <laughs> Have you any ideas? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so a dot, 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 dot. <laughs> Yeah. No, I won't care. You have to come see it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, oh, I'm sorry. To, to, uh, kind of, uh, to, to chat with you about this. I'm sure that everyone who's been listening is now kind of absolutely bent on buying their tickets to come to the performance. And thank you very much. Thank for you. Thank you. I'm <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean that. <laughs> no, I'm not going to ask questions. <laughs> He's on now. Is it me? Okay, so I'm going to introduce one more bit that we're going to see this evening and move a chair out the way. Um, so I already introduced it. We're going to see the night that hasn't fully been described in her diaries, but um, you might be able to remember it better. I think she talks about, it's, uh, I mean the wedding night. So actually I think what happens on a wedding night is she gets a horrible headache, but we kind of ignored that and pretended it was the next night because we don't want to see Victoria with a headache on her wedding night. Um, but she does describe in her diaries about being kissed all over, I'm paraphrasing, um, and clearly it's, it's a wonderful experience for all concerned. Um, so we are going to do that for you now. <laughs> Have we got the dancers? Where are, oh, they're up there. <laughs> they're poking out. I should stand up so I can introduce you. This is Abby, who is clearly Queen Victoria, and Joe, who is Albert. 
I'd buy a ticket to see that. <laughs> Definitely. I'd buy two, in fact. 
Um, I'd like to uh, thank Kathy so much for sharing. It's, it's quite difficult at this point in the process to sort of check out a bit and be so entertaining and welcoming to our public, and we really appreciate that from you. Um, you are able to juggle a lot of things at the same time. I mean, you should see her with her two kids. Like, her husband and her two kids were in the studio, and I think they were learning part of, the, especially Viv was learning part of the ballet. Yeah, she did draw the poster. She showed me that. She wouldn't speak to me, but she did show me her poster, which was, told me she was very proud of her mother, I think. Um, I'd like to thank the dancers, who I think have disappeared already, um, for doing such a great job. And uh, for Andrew at the piano. We love Andrew. He's just fantastic. So, if you haven't bought your ticket, I hope, like I said, this encourages you to. But also, you can have a slightly different experience with this ballet because on June 25th, Victoria hits the cinemas, the big screen. And it, it is a very different experience, I, I think, um, watching the other movies that we've made in the past few years. So please think of that. Also, if you have uh, any young children, we're also presently in the cinemas with some of our children's ballets. So we're, we're kind of everywhere at the moment, which is really great. Um, I'd like to thank Uzma, as well as Professor Mitchell, for joining us this evening. That was you really did a beautiful job of that uh, Q&A. Really, sometimes it can have a moment in there where everybody's like, but you just kept it moving, and the questions were fantastic, and, and uh, you had two quite wonderful people to talk to. So I think that always makes it work so well. Um, so I'd really like to mention uh, First Direct, because for quite a while now, um, they have been a, a sponsor of Northern Ballet, but it has really grown up over the years. And recently, they became our tour sponsor and also have um, dressed up our, you call them lorries, but I want to call them trucks, um, that move our sets. And I'm sure some of you may have seen our beautiful images are, are on these massive um, trucks. And it's just a very beautiful thing to see. And it's a great advertisement, I think, for both of us. But now, they've really stepped up and done an amazing thing. And they've now become our national stage and screen sponsor, which is just amazing. Um, that's what's allowing us to do, um, for instance, Victoria, and uh, to continue on um, presenting some of our work at the cinema. So I'd really like to thank you. I mean, it's just fantastic, and it, it's essential to us. And um, I think the, the last thing I have to say this evening is enjoy a drink. But if you have enjoyed this evening, please uh, consider uh, donating to our Victoria Costume Appeal, which is being launched this evening. Um, our wardrobe is, is actually phenomenal with what they, they do up there. In kind of not that big a room, and uh, right now it does feel like there are elves coming at night trying to get these many costumes <laughs> that have grown over the process here with Miss Marston. It was kind of a little ballet when it started, and now it's a massive ballet. All these red people and all these soldiers and things and politicians and coats for days. I've had several of them on, and I do look quite good in some of them. And uh, it's, uh, y th they just really do a sensational job, and there are lots of costumes to be made, and it does it takes a lot of time to make a dancer's costume because it isn't like ordinary clothing. It has to look like it, but it has to be able to move so and uh, be comfortable to dance in. So I think that's it from me. Thank you all. Thank you, those out there in the world who are watching us now. I hope you enjoyed it too. I can't see you, but I do feel your energy. So thanks a lot. Enjoy the evening.